All right, folks, it's Brian, and we're back for week 15 of the Physics 122 course. This is our last week of instruction. And normally in this last week, I have a couple of topics I would do. I would do in a more extensive treatment of optical instruments, microscopes, telescopes, and also look at the physics of vision. But this year, given the challenges and the changes in the instruction, I think I just want to do review. So we're going to spend this whole week doing review and synthesis. So ha having a chance to look at all the things that we've learned and then think about basically where can you take it. So here's an overview of what we're going to do. So today we're going to talk about concepts to applications and modeling. So I'm going to take, say like here's something that's happening in the world. How can I use the laws of physics that we've learned to model what's happening here? Wednesday we're going to talk about reviewing some concepts. So the big picture of everything we've learned in the course, and it's going to be a whole bunch of rapid fire questions to test how well you remember those lessons that we learned earlier in the semester. And then Friday is exam practice. We're going to look at past exam scenarios. This week in lab, optics of the eye, really fun lab. I really like that one. And you'll have a quiz on the optics of the eye. That's the um, related to some of the stuff you saw in the homework assignment last week. And I have an extra assignment, homework assignment number 12. And I typically don't have a homework assignment number 12, but I'm doing one this week. And the point is to give you more chance to review and put the pieces together, and also a chance to earn a little bit of extra credit. And I'll let you look at the Canvas page for more details. And then week, final exam week, of course, we're going to have exam number three. Okay, and all the details are posted on Canvas. So I want you to check out the details on Canvas. So this week, as I said, it's all review. We're going to be applying physics concepts to the real world. So all the stuff that we've learned, what does it allow us to say about the operation of the world? And basically it's this. We have all this cool stuff that we've learned. Where can we take it? What does it allow us to say? Our focus today is going to be on light and color and optics. And the reason for that is this, this is the stuff you've covered most recently. It's the stuff that's freshest in your mind. So I want to basically model an approach to analyzing the physical world using the topic that you're at present most familiar with. Now I want to review the basic principles that we saw about light. So we said when light goes at a boundary between two media, there's a, there's a process called refraction that bends the light. If I have a lens of a certain shape, it's going to bring the light to a focus. And if I bring the light to a focus, I can create an image. Okay, so that's our three-step process that goes from like the physical process of refraction, bringing light to a focus, making an image. And we've talked about those different pieces. So that's the basic physics. And let's see where we can take it. So here's my first question for you, and this is just a puzzle. I want you to take a look at this picture and say, what the heck is happening? What is going on? I want you to take a minute. I want you to pause the video and see if you can analyze what's happening. I'll be back. Well, what's happening is this. These are little water droplets on this leaf and they've collected and they've kind of beat it up. And, and when they do that, you end up with a water droplet that has a shape like this. It works like a converging lens. If I have rays of light that come into a water droplet, they will get brought to a focus just like they would for a lens. And so as a consequence, a droplet of water can make a real image of the foliage that's behind it. And so you can see, here's an image of the foliage, and here's one, and here's one. And so you have different droplets, but they're all making images of the same patch of flowers that is someplace in the hazy distance. And if you look, here's some yellow in the image. Here's the yellow over here. Because the image, and oh yeah, and here's some red. And here's the red down here. And you can see the image, it's a real image, and so it's going to be inverted. And so the positions of the yellow and the red are going to be inverted. So this is a droplet of water making an image. Now here's something else, and this has to do with the things that we've been talking about with vision. Chickens have amazing degrees of accommodation of their vision. Up to 20 diopters of accommodation. For you, you have about 10 diopters of accommodation. And chickens have significantly more. Why would we expect this to be true? I want you to think about that, come up with an answer, and then we'll talk about it as a group. I'll be back.
Well, let's remember our basic relationship for the power of your visual system. We said the power of the visual system was equal to 60 plus 1 over s. And for the chicken, it's going to be something similar, although they'll have a different number than 60. This number here is the object distance. And if the object distance decreases, 1 over f, which is the power of the visual system, has to increase. Okay, the power of the visual system has to go up to look at closer and closer objects, and that's why you have a near point. And for you, the maximum power of your visual, the maximum accommodation is about 10. So what we'd say is this. If your vision is completely relaxed and you're looking at something at infinity, your power of your visual system, 60 plus 1 over infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. It's just equal to 60. So the power of your visual system is 60. If I have 10 diopters of accommodation, the total power of my visual system is 70. We can figure out what distance that lets you see at. If I calculate that, I get a distance of 0 0.10 meters. That's 10 centimeters. Well, 10 centimeters is a reasonable near point for you. But if you're a chicken, you've got to be taking your beak and using it to forage for food, and your eyeball is right here, this distance is significantly less than 10 centimeters. And so for chickens to be able to effectively peck for things on the ground and be able to tell what they're pecking at, they're going to need to be able to focus much closer. If this distance s is going to be smaller, the power of the visual system is going to have to be higher. And so instead of 10 diopters of accommodation, 20 diopters of accommodation is more reasonable for them. Now here's a bird that has an even higher degree of accommodation. These are cormorants, and these are diving birds. Oh, by the way, um, the cormorants also have structural color. If you look at the purple and you look at the green, that's structural color in the feathers, which is kind of awesome. But anyway, cormorants have about 60 diopters of accommodation compared to 20 for the chicken. Why would cormorants have to have such an incredible degree of accommodation? And I'm going to mention they are diving birds. Okay, they are diving birds. So think about that. And why would you expect them to have such a high degree of accommodation? Go ahead and give that some thought. I'll be back. Oh, by the way, I don't want you to just jump ahead and look at the next slide where I give the answer, you scamp. Actually, I'm jumping ahead to the next slide. You're just jumping ahead in the video. Don't jump ahead in the video to just look at the answer, you scamp. What I want you to do is I want you to really, for realsies, pause the video and think about this and think about what's the difference when the bird goes from being in the air to being in the water. And the cormorants will do that. They dive and they can see well in the air. They can also see well underwater. Why would that imply a high degree of accommodation? Keep thinking. I'll be back. Let's take a look at our simple model for the eye. Okay, I when I draw the model of the eye, I usually draw it like this with a single imaging system in front. But in fact, the way the eye looks is this. I've got a lens inside the eye, but that's below the surface of the eye. And over top of it, there's a cornea. So this is kind of a better view. So rays of light come in. They bend when they hit the cornea. They also get bent when they hit the lens. And they're brought to a focus on the retina. But if you look at the power of your visual system, you have a power, a power of about 60 for your relaxed vision because we have 1 over f is equal to 60 plus 1 over f, 1 over s. Your distant vision, power of your visual system is 60 if the distance is infinity. So you have about 60 diopters of refractive power of your eye when it's relaxed. Well, for you, about 40 diopters of that comes from the cornea, and about 20 diopters of it comes from the lens. But mostly it comes from the cornea, and the reason it comes from the cornea is you have lots of bending. Um, when the light goes from air into the watery tissues of the cornea, there's a fair amount of bending. When it's going inside your eye, okay, inside the eye, it's going from the watery tissues of the eye into other watery tissues of the eye, the difference in the index of refraction is much, much less. And so as a consequence, you don't get as much refraction. You don't get as much refractive power. So think about this. Cormorant in the air, really good vision. When it goes underwater, it loses most of the focusing power of the cornea. When you go underwater, 
you lose the power of the focusing of the cornea almost most entirely. And that changes your vision. So if you're a cormorant, that's not going to work. So what the cormorant does is it changes. It does additional accommodation for the lens of its eye when it goes underwater and that allows it to be able to see crisply underwater as well as above water because it can make up for the loss of refractive power of the cornea when it's underwater. And it's kind of a remarkable thing and their eyes just basically snap to attention when they go underwater and very quickly change to a new regime. And here's a summary of, of that point. There's 40 diopters of focusing power at the cornea, about 20 diopters from the lens. Most of the focusing happens at the cornea because that's where there's the biggest index of refraction. Now I want to think about this. Penguins have extremely flat corneas. And if you look at the penguin from the side, you can see this cornea, it's very flat. They're not like bulging out like so. They're very, very flat. Why would you expect that to be true? Go ahead and give that some thought. I'll be back. Let's take a look at the situation here. Okay, so we've seen that lenses that converge have this kind of shape. And the reason they have that kind of shape is the rays of light bend at one surface and at the other surface, and that brings them together. And if you have a lens that's fatter, it has a higher refractive power. It brings light to a focus in a shorter distance, and so therefore is gonna have a higher refractive power because the refractive power is one over F. If you took a lens that was completely flat, okay, if you took a lens that was completely flat, like so, the rays of light might bend as they go through it, but they wouldn't be brought to a focus, okay? They might be bent inside here, but they're not gonna be brought to a focus at all. So if you have an eye where you have a really, really flat cornea, and you go into water, you're not gonna lose any focusing power all the focusing power is gonna to have to be provided by the lens of your eye. And so you're gonna get lot, a lot less difference about looking in air and looking in underwater. And penguins have to work above the water and under the water as well as cormorants. And they just have a slightly different way of dealing with it. Now here's a question, given, every, given everything that we've talked about in water, are you going to be nearsighted or are you going to be farsighted, given everything that we've talked about. I want you to take a minute and I want you to pause and I want you to, for real, pause the video. Think about what you know about vision. Think about what you know about how light focuses. I'll be back. Now, think about our basic situation here. We said, if you're talking about your relaxed vision, the power of your visual system is about 60 diopters. Of that, about 40 diopters comes from your cornea. About 20 diopters of it comes from the lens. But when you go underwater, you lose most of this 40 diopters. So what that means is it reduces the power of your visual system. But what that's gonna mean in terms of your vision, remember we said people who are farsighted, people who are farsighted have the power of their visual system is too low because you need to have a higher power visual system to be able to see closer up because remember our basic relationship, one over F is equal to 60 plus one over S. If this number decreases, the power has to increase. And if you can't increase the power enough, that means you can't look at close objects, you are farsighted. So if you're nearsighted and you go underwater, you will be farsighted, but not as farsighted as a person with normal vision. And remember, that was one of the superpowers that we said that nearsighted people possess. Nearsighted people um, have better underwater vision and actually significantly better if you're significantly nearsighted. Here's another question for you. An octopus actually has really, really good vision. As a matter of fact, if you look at their eyes, except for the crazy shape of their irises, their eyes are actually very similar to yours and they have really, really good vision. But here's a question for you. In the air, if you took an octopus and you took it out of the water, would it be nearsighted or would it be 
farsighted. I want you to think about that. Think about what you know about vision. I'll be back. Well, an octopus's eye actually has a fairly curved cornea. So it's got a, an eye that looks like this, a fairly curved cornea, and then it's got a lens inside here. So it's normally not getting very much bending of light at the cornea at all. The focusing happens because of the lens in the eye. Because underwater, there's not very much difference between the index of refraction of the cornea and of the water surrounding it. But if an octopus is in the air, all of a sudden it's going to pick up additional focusing power from the cornea, and as a consequence, images will form in front of the retina. It's going to be nearsighted. Its visual system is going to have too high a power. And as we've seen, that's the hallmark of nearsightedness or myopia. So if you pull an octopus out of the water and it's squinting at you, that's just because you just made it nearsighted by pulling it out into the water. Now here's kind of an interesting thing. I had a, someone years ago approached me with an idea to make underwater vision correction. And I said, well, how about if you want to see clearly underwater, you wear a swim mask. And what that does is that makes a pocket of air in front of your eyes. And so you don't lose the focusing power of your cornea. But he said, no, no, I want my eyes to be able to freely commune with the liquidy medium in which I'm swimming. But I want still to be able to see. And so I want to make underwater glasses. And he said he was going to do that by making a, a lens that is made not of glass, but it's filled with air. So he said, let's just make a shape. Okay, let's make a shape and let's put it underwater and, and, and it's going to be a shape that's filled with air. So here's my little air filled lens shape. Lens is shaped like that. If I put it underwater, here's my question. Would this be a converging or a diverging lens? I want you to think about that. And think about how the light is going to bend at the interfaces. I'll be back. Now let's think about how the rays of light are going to go. So if a ray of light comes in through the center of the lens, it's just going to continue out the other side. But if a ray of light comes in here and hits this boundary, we can draw a normal. And since it's going from water into air, it's going to bend to a bigger angle with respect to the normal. So this is the angle with respect to the normal in the water. It's going to bend to a bigger angle inside. And then when it goes out, it's going to bend to a smaller angle. As a consequence, it's going to get bent toward the optical axis. And so this lens is going to work as a converging lens an air-filled shape like this underwater will converge rays of light. And when you're underwater, you are, as we've seen, you are hyperopic. Okay, you're hyperopic. The power of your visual system is too low. You are going to need a converging lens. And so this shape right here would work for underwater vision correction. Now I want to look at animal vision, and, and we've talked a little bit about it, but I want to look at horses. And horses have this really amazing structure to their eye. And the particular problem I'm going to share with you is something that was born on an exam in Physics 122 back in the day. But here's the situation. So I want you to pause, or actually I want you, I'm going to pause. I want you to pause the video with this slide up, and I want you to read everything through. So I'm going to give you a moment to read everything through and wrap your mind around what it's saying. All right, so you focus your eye by changing the shape of your lens. Horses don't. What horses have is they have, their eye isn't spherical, and so they have different values of one over S prime. Now for you, we've said one over S prime is equal to 60, but for a horse, that's not true. It varies. The distance from the lens to the retina varies. It varies from a large distance at the top of a lens to a small distance 
at the bottom of the lens. And what that means is objects are going objects at different distances will appear in focus or not at different places on the retina. Now let's look at some questions. So here's my two questions. In a horse's eye, the image of a close object, is that in focus at the top of the retina or at the bottom? And then do the same thing for a distant object. Is it in focus at the top or the bottom of the retina? Look at the picture. Think about our basic relationships. Come up with some answers for those questions. I'll be back. Now let's take a look at our basic relationship for lenses and images. It's this, 1 over f is equal to 1 over s prime plus 1 over s. If the distance s decreases, the distance s prime is going to increase. Because in the case of the horse's eye, this number, the focal length, stays the same. It doesn't change the shape of the lens of its eye. So, Small values of s are going to correspond to big values of s prime, given our mathematical relationship. What that means is a close object will be in focus at a long distance, and the long distance is at the top of the retina. Conversely, if I have a large distance, I'm going to have a small value of s prime. Small value of s prime corresponds to this number right here. That's at the bottom of the retina. And those are our answers. Now here's something I want to ask you. Rel think about that thing that you just did, okay? And think about this. A horse is looking straight ahead at a person who is standing quite close. So small distance. The image of the person spans much of the vertical extent of the retina. What can you say about the image on the retina? Go ahead and think about this. Think about what you know about images come up with the answer, I'll be back. Well, one thing we know about images is this. This will be a real image. So the image of the person will be upside down on the retina. Okay, the, per the image will be upside down on the retina. And the person is standing quite close. And as we've seen, the close objects will be in focus on the top of the retina. The, the, at the bottom of the retina, the image won't be in focus. So the person's feet are going to be in focus. The head is going to be out of focus. And so the correct answer for this one is B. Now, interestingly, I have heard, and I, and I, and I ha don't have a lot of experience with horses, but I've heard that if you approach a horse and it tips its head back, what it's actually trying to do is it's trying to tip its head back so that it's pointing in a different direction, so the image of you appears here on its retina. And as a consequence, the image of your face is in focus. And so it's just trying to basically put you at the right point on its retina so that your head is in focus rather than your feet. And here's another problem related to horse vision that I want you to consider. So certain medical conditions can change the shape of the horse's eyeball, can change the shape of a human's eyeball too. Um, the changes can affect vision. If the lens and cornea are not changed, but all the distances are increased slightly, so the horse's eyeball gets longer. Well, then that's something that can happen, something like that can happen to humans too. What will that do to the horse's vision? Will it make it nearsighted, farsighted, or just unable to focus? Think about that. I'll be back. Well, remember our basic relationship. Our basic relationship is that 1 over f is equal to 1 over s plus 1 over s prime. That's our basic relationship for all images. So what we did is we took the values of s prime and they got bigger. Okay, what that's going to do is it's going to make the necessary power of the lens decrease. Oh, except the horse can't decrease the power of his lens because it doesn't change. What that's going to mean is the power of the lens is going to be too great for the conditions that exist. And if the power of your lens is too great for the conditions that exist, that means that you're nearsighted. 
And that is one thing that can happen to humans as well. If there are conditions that lengthen your eyeball, that will have the effect of making you nearsighted. Conversely, if you have a condition that shortens your eyeball, that will make you farsighted. Or, as you, and I have to say this too, I am nearsighted, but as I get older, um, what happens is the length of my eyeball is going to start to decrease. That happens. Um, just soft tissues tend to shrink a little bit as you get older. Um, that will make me less nearsighted. My mother was nearsighted, and then as she got into her 60s, she was actually able to stop wearing glasses and get the driver's, the thing that on her driver's license that said she had to wear glasses, was able to get that removed, which is kind of awesome. So there's one good thing that happens as you get older. There are many but that's one. Now, one of the things that happens to people as you age is you lose the ability to be able to focus, to be able to accommodate your eyes very much. And what that means is you can get lenses that have not just one focal distance, but actually more than one. And this is an image of a pair of bifocals, two focal lengths. One is the focal length for everything up here. And then there's a second area down here which has a different focal length and that allows you to focus for your distance vision and for your close vision. You can look at that section of the lens and actually I've got lenses that work like this but bifocals are pretty old school. I don't know of anybody who has those these days um, except for certain very specific conditions but for me the power varies across the lens from the top to the bottom. I have a variation of a couple of diopters of focus of refractive power from the top to the bottom. And then I can just choose to look through different parts of the lens. I look through here, I get one folk, I get one power. I look through here, I get another power. So I can look through the top of the lens for close vi for distance vision, look through the bottom of the lens for far vision, I'm sorry, for close vision, and look through the middle for things in between. And so I can just tip my head back and forth to make the world be in a sharp focus, just like a horse. So when you come up to a horse and it rears its head back, it's probably trying to get a look at you. If you approach me and I rear my head back, I'm not, don't be alarmed, I'm not threatening. I'm just trying to get a sharp look at you. I want to pause for another installment. And I haven't done this for far too long about things that I like about your generation. And here's what something I've noticed as we've all been kind of like doing things slightly differently. This generation of people that I'm dealing with right now, you folks, are relentlessly positive. Mostly when I talk with people, um, people are positive. They're, they're saying like this is a difficult time, but they're doing okay. They're looking on the bright side and they're thinking about the positive changes and people have mostly been happy. You folks tend to have a rather positive outlook, a rather optimistic outlook on the world. Um, you're not set back as, as much as other generations would have been by things like this. And I want you to know this. You have this positive outlook and it makes you more resilient than other generations have been. You folks are well adapted to the current conditions. And I'm sad, I'm really sad that you're going through it, but I'm glad that you're reacting as well as you are. Now, I wanna remind you of some physics that we talked about previously. Okay, if you have light and you go th goes through like a double slit here, it creates a diffraction pattern. If we looked at the properties of the diffraction pattern, I just wanna remind you of a couple things about that. So suppose I'm using red light with double slits and I'm making an interference pattern on screen. If green light is used, but everything else stays the same, what will that do to the positions of the bright fringes? Remind yourself of what you know about diffraction. I'll be back. And by the way, this is the type of thing we're going to do lots of on Wednesday. Wednesday is a whole bunch of, let's look at this problem. What do you think the answer to this is? But it's going to span everything we've talked about in the whole course. But in this case, let's think about our basic relationship for diffraction. And I'm going to use our equation for uh, diffraction grading because that works for double slits as well, as we talked about. D sine theta is equal to m times lambda. m is the order of the diffraction. If I go from red light to green light, going from red light to green light, the wavelength decreases. Wavelengths um, red light has long wavelength, green light has shorter wavelengths. So if the wavelength decreases, what that means is sine of theta is going to decrease. Sine of theta, if sine of theta decreases, theta is going to decrease as well. And so as a consequence, 
um, the pattern is going to get smaller. So if I have red light, it's like that. If I have green light, the fringes are going to be moved over a little bit. They're going to be packed in a little bit tighter. And so the spacing between the fringes will be less. They will be closer together. Oh my gosh, fringes, you scamps. We are supposed to be doing social distancing and you're packing in closer together. Don't do it. But in this case, they would be getting closer together. Now, here's something that relates back to something we talked about back in chapter 28. So suppose I'm using a beam of electrons and I'm putting it through a double slit. And if I do that, I actually get a diffraction pattern. I get up because the electron has this wave nature associated with it. How about if the electrons had a higher speed? What would that do? to the appearance of the fringes. So that's relating the concepts of diffraction and the concepts of the wave nature of matter that we talked about previously. We're putting it all together. That's the type of thing I'm thinking to do as we move closer and closer to the end of the course. So what will it be? Think about it. I'll be back. You didn't think about it. You just were going to jump ahead to the point where I gave away the answer, you scamp. So what I want you to do is I want you to go back to chapter 28 and I want you to review this notion of the de Broglie wavelength. Okay, what is the de Broglie wavelength for a particle moving at a certain speed? Review that and see how that informs your result. Now looking back at chapter 28, the wavelength of moving particles is this, h over m times v. So the electrons are going at a higher speed. What that means is they're going to have a shorter wavelength. And we've seen that a shorter wavelength means the diffraction pattern will have fringes that are closer together. Now, I want to bring up the idea of holograms. And we've talked about real images, okay? And, 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 and someday you're going to have like holograms that you can just like project out into space, but you can currently get holograms that you can project on a screen. And if you were in class, I have these wonderful glasses they have people wear that are make little holograms, they make a little hologram of the RAM, RAM logo. Really, really sorry. But if you see me on campus, you can come to my office. I will set you up and show you a pair of these hollow specs that I have. But I just want to bring something up because this is kind of awesome. If you take a beam of light and you put it through a double slit pattern, a double slit, you get a certain pattern on the screen. But if what I can do is I can take an image that I want to appear on a screen and I can take a mathematical function and apply it to it. It's called the Fourier transform. And that gives me a pattern of light and dark lines. If I take that pattern of light and dark lines and I put it on a piece of film and I pass a laser or a, a source of monochromatic light through it, it makes the image on the screen. And so I have glasses that have the Fourier transform of the RAM logo. And when you shine a laser through it, it makes a RAM logo on a screen. Or if you put them on and you look at a distant point light source, you can see a little RAM logo, which is super awesome. But that's something known as holography, and that's something that is very, very doable. Now, I want to bring up this idea. If you pass a beam of light through a grating, you can make any pattern that you want. But we've seen matter has a wave nature. So could I pass a beam of matter through a grating and make a physical object? And that's the idea behind the replicator on Star Trek, is that I've stored some sort of a pattern, I send beams of particles through it, and they materialize and make some sort of an object. One of the awesome things I love about Star Trek, strangely, I'm, you, you might not suspect this, but I'm not like a huge fan of sci-fi, but I love Star Trek because there's all this technology on this ship that is actually grounded in real science. And in this case, the people who um, kind of like thought about how you represent different features on the ship, thought really, really hard about this idea of the replicators, and it's related to this idea of holography, which I think is like super cool. Now, I want to talk about vision at the level of sensing by individual rod and cone cells on your retina. And these are the rod cells because they've got this rod shape associated with them, as is not surprising. And then we've got the cone cells that are more coney. The rod cells are the ones that sense light. They're very, very sensitive to light, but they're not particularly good at distinguishing color. The cone cells are tuned to only pick up certain colors. 
Now, in low light, colors are indistinct. And the reason that colors are indistinct in low light is because in low light, it's mostly your rod cells that are weighing in, and your rod cells do not distinguish different colors. And the retinol, which is the molecule that does the sensing, okay, um, in the retinol, in the rhodopsin, in the rod cells, has a threshold of 1.8 electron volts. So the, if you're looking at light that has an uh, energy of the photons that's less than that, it will not trigger a transition in the rod cells. You won't be able to see it. First question, what wavelength in nanometers does this correspond to? Take a second, remind yourself of that basic relationship. I'll be back. And remember, we had this basic relationship where we said originally the energy of a photon oh, I'm going to say in electron volts, in electron volts was equal to 1240 divided by the wavelength in nanometers. I can invert that to say that the wavelength in nanometers is equal to 1240 divided by the energy in electron volts. And so with that relationship hand I, in hand, I can compute what the, energy, uh, what the wavelength of a one point EV photon is. And what I get is I get a wavelength of about 690 nanometers. And that's towards the red end of the spectrum. That's not a hard edge. That's the threshold. Like nothing happens below 1.8 electron volts. But what that means is towards the red end of the spectrum, your rods, your, uh, towards the red end of the spectrum, your rod cells are really not kind of like picking very much up. So first question related to this idea, and this again is taking the concepts that we've been learning and applying them to the world. If you're doing astronomy and you want to preserve your night vision for looking at the sky, but you want to look at your charts or your instruments or whatever, um, astronomers use red flashlights. Why would they do that? Think about it. I'll be back. Well, the red flashlights are going to have a wavelength that is so long, basically the rod cells are not going to respond to them. So as a consequence, you don't ruin your night vision. It's just going to be being picked up by your cone cells, but it's the rod cells that give you your night vision. So you can look at things with a red light. You can see clearly. You can read, do what you need to do. Turn your light off. Your night vision is intact. Another thing. Why are fire trucks no longer red as a rule? Fire engines are not fire engine red. And of course, we know this because like red is a color you don't see very well at night. So why would you paint your fire truck red? In fact, what you want to do is you want to paint it a color that is maximally picked up by your rod cells. You want to paint it kind of a yellow greeny color and that is a popular color or just paint it white so you get all the colors. Um, but fire trucks generally not red these days. Now here's a question for you. When you actually sense light, your retina actually gets bleached a little bit. It gets bleached a little bit. And this is a picture of the retina after it's been hit with light. And then later, and this is a movie, but I can't show it in a static situation, this will darken. It's hit by a flashlight and boom, it bleaches. Why would the retina lighten when it's exposed to light? And this goes a little bit beyond what we've talked about, but, but think about this. Photons come in, photons come in, and they hit the retina, and they're supposed to be absorbed. If they're absorbed, they basically change the structure of a molecule. And so it's not ready to absorb another photon. So if it's going to absorb light, it should appear dark. But once it has absorbed light, it will appear lighter because it's not ready to absorb another photon. And so it has to do with the physics of how light interacts with matter. Now, there's this concept known as fluorescence that was covered in chapter 29. I talked about it briefly. If I have ultraviolet light coming in and striking something like this shirt, which has um, compounds in it that are fluorescent, the light is absorbed and then re-emitted at longer wavelengths. Okay, that's a concept known as fluorescence. Light is absorbed and emitted at longer wavelengths. Here's a slide that kind of explains what's happening. If you have molecules, I have 
not just single levels that the electrons can live in, but I have entire bands that they can live in anywhere inside that band. So a ray of light comes in, or light comes in, pops an electron from the lower level of this energy band, and it can go anywhere into this upper band. So there's lots of range that can be absorbed. Then subsequently, the electrons work their way to the lower edge of the upper band, and then they fall from there down into any place in the lower band. But as a consequence, think about this, the energies of the absorbed photons are bigger than the energies of the emitted photons. So as a consequence, this light here is going to be short wavelengths. Over here, the light that's emitted is going to be longer wavelengths. And so the emitted light is going to have a longer wavelength. And here's a little slide that refers to it, and you can take a look at that in chapter 29 if you'd like. And here's a place where it's used for mineral identification. These are minerals which are being illuminated with ultraviolet light from above. And you can see they shine, they glow in a variety of different colors, and you can use that to kind of like help tell what kind of mineral you have. Now your vision okay, you have three different cone cells in your eye. You've got one that's sensitive to the blue light. It's got a range of sensitivity like so. One that's primarily sensitive to red light and one that's sensitive to green light. And this is a, a slide which is actually in chapter 25. And we're going to use it in the lab this week. You have three different cones tuned to three different photon energies. Okay? But I want to take a look at this graph right here. Notice a couple of things. One is there's actually a long tail of the red. Kind of like here's 700 nanometers, which we've said is kind of the edge of the visible light spectrum, but it actually goes past here. And there's some sensitivity all the way out to about 1,000 nanometers. It's kind of a long tail in the infrared. But in the other end, in the blue end of the spectrum, everything cuts off very sharply right here. You don't have kind of much of an edge. So if we look beyond the rainbow, And here is a picture I took with my phone, and I put a filter over top of it that absorbed all the visible light but transmitted the infrared. So it transmitted all the light, which had a wavelength bigger than about 750 nanometers. And this is an image of the world um, in the infrared. And you can see it looks red because my camera said, like, I don't know from infrared, but it's kind of at the red end of the spectrum. The trees that I took a picture of, they look very, very light, and the ground looks very light as well. You would look at this and say like, oh, it's, fro it's frost, but I took this picture in Africa, and trust me, this was not a frosty day. This was a very, very hot day. It turns out the photons are so low energy, they hit a plant, and the plant's like, that's too low energy for me to do anything with, and so they just bounce off. They just reflect that. The energies of the photons are too low um, for them to be useful to the plants. You say you can look at the world and it kind of has this bizarre look. I have glasses that will let you do just that. They will let you see beyond the end of the, the, the spectrum into the infrared. And again, catch me on campus, come to my office, I will set you up. It's an amazing kind of like view. But your camera will do it as well. You can see beyond the rainbow. But at the other end of the rainbow, it's very different. If you shine ultraviolet light in someone's eye, it turns out the lens in your eye fluoresces. And because the lens in your eye fluoresces, it's actually absorbing the light. And so you have this sharp edge at the low, low the short wavelengths. You can't see ultraviolet, not because the rod and cone cells couldn't detect it, but because the energy is so high, it actually reacts with the tissues of your eye and does not make it into your retina. I want to briefly take a look at vision in other animals. Now, it turns out dogs do have limited color vision, but you have three different cones. Dogs have two. They've got a blue cone and they've got a yellow cone, like so. And so they don't actually see out into the reds very well. They don't see into the reds, but they definitely see the blues. They see shades of, of blue, which is kind of cool. And they have a, in the fovea, in the sharp part of their vision, they have a higher density of rod cells. Now the rod cells are sensitive to low light conditions, so dogs have better night vision, but also they're extremely sensitive to motion. And so dogs are extremely good at detecting motion. Chickens, <laughs> and, and, and this is kind of crazy, chickens have four different color 
cones. Okay, and they can they have much better color vision than you do. To be able to rep, reproduce your color vision, I just need three colors. For chickens, I would need four. And they can see into the ultraviolet. Look at this, they have a cone where the peak of its sensitivity is at 360 nanometers. That's beyond the range that you can see. They can see into the ultraviolet, and actually most birds can, and this ultraviolet sensitivity is really, really important for them because ultraviolet light is absorbed by things that are fluorescent. And one thing that is strongly fluorescent is urine. And so mice are running along through the, through the bush and they're, they're weeing as they go. They leave behind a little trail of urine. Now urine looks pretty transparent, but it's very fluorescent. So ultraviolet light from the sun comes in and hits it and it's absorbed. And so it's, from your point of view, you're not going to see the urine trail, but the kestrel is going to see a dark line on the ground because they can see the ultraviolet and the ultraviolet is not reflected by the urine. It is strongly absorbed because it's strongly fluorescent and this gives them a leg up and trying to spot little critters that are cruising around um, in, the, in the vegetation. Very, very cool. You can also use this to make protective glass. If you take glass and you put strips in it that look dark in ultraviolet light, birds see that. And so they won't see that as a mirror or as, or as a window. They won't see it looking just transparent like that. They will see it having features in it. And so you can make bird protective glass. And my thought is, let's just start putting these in buildings. It doesn't cost that much more and it will prevent bird strikes. So why not? One last piece of animal vision I want to talk about is with bees. Bees do not have the same visual acuity as you, but their vision has certain advantages. This is kind of an awesome thing. We've seen light. Now bees don't have your, the same visual acuity as you, but their vision is better than yours in a couple ways. One is bees are actually sensitive to the polarization of light, which is kind of awesome. But bees too can see into the ultraviolet. They don't see reds. So when you look flowers. If there's reds on flowers, the bees are not seeing them. The reds aren't there for you, are there for you, not for, not for the bees. But if you look at other flowers, like this um, buttercup right here, the buttercup looks very featureless to you, but it's got pigments in the ultraviolet. And the pigments in the ultraviolet give it a nice little bullseye for the bee. And this one here, here's another one. Uh, another aster and you can see in the visible light in the ultraviolet it looks extremely different and so they have pigments which are basically just intended for the bees which is very very cool that's enough for me for this time what we're going to do next time is we're going to do more review and more synthesis and before next time i want you to take a look back at everything we've learned in the course because we're going to do basically a lightning round we're going to go through lots and lots and lots of questions having to do with everything we've learned in the course and you're going to do that to basically review the concepts the point of today's class was to just say let's take everything we've learned and yet you use it to talk about the world. And that's typically the way I write tests. I just look at the world and say, here's something kind of cool. Would I be able to use what we've learned in the Physics 122 class to see something interesting about it? And if so, I try to problemize it. And so this class today was kind of a window into the mind of Brian as he's putting together exam number three. Next time, lightning review. I'll talk to you then.